Welcome to our webinar with Dr. Hamida Magani, preparing for safe and healthy return to school. My name is Pat Daly. I'm the Director of Education with the Halton Catholic District School Board. We're very thankful you've been able to join us tonight. We hope the information we present to you uh, will be valuable and, um, and put, your, put your mind at ease uh, in terms of uh, your sons and daughters coming to join us beginning September 7th. Before we begin our pre presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which we gather. Halton, as we know it today, is rich in history and modern traditions of many First Nations and the Métis. From the Anishinaabe to the Attawandaran, the Haudenosaunee and the Métis, these lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in Indigenous history. As we gather today on these treaty lands, we have the responsibility to honour and respect the four directions, lands, waters, plants, animals, ancestors that walk before us and all the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We'd like to acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for sharing their traditional territory with us. And as we always do, we'd like to start uh, our evening in prayer. So please join me in the sign of our faith in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, make us better people. Lead us always to greater knowledge and understanding and to grow in wisdom and goodness. Help us to be kind and gentle to those entrust, entrusted to our care and to make our schools places of joy and peace. We ask this in your name, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, so I'd just like to give you a brief overview uh, tonight's session. So um, we will have a presentation by Dr. McGanny. Um, followed by that will be a question and answer period. And the, the questions that Dr. McGanny will be addressing uh, were ones that we asked you to submit uh, via an online form over the past week or so. Uh, we got hundreds of questions. Uh, obviously tonight we can't answer hundreds, uh, but we did try to pull together the most frequently asked questions uh, that were uh, directed to uh, Dr. McGanny. There were some other questions that were directed more to a school board perspective. Um, so following the, the question and answer period, I'm going to provide an overview of our Halton Catholic return to school plan. And then we'll also be taking those questions to inform uh, an FAQ section on our board website. So I would like to, to welcome Dr. Hamida McGanny this evening. She's the Commissioner and Medical Officer of Health for Halton Region. Dr. McGanny has been a tremendous partner with our school board, uh, her and her department. Uh, we've been working closely with Halton Public Health for the past, I guess it's 18 or 19 months now. Uh, we really do appreciate you giving your time to us tonight, Dr. McGanny, and do appreciate the work of you and all of your staff and help supporting our students and families. Well, thank you so much for those kind words, Pat. And we've been very happy to uh, partner with the Halton Catholic District School Board for actually many years, uh, but more significantly in the last 18 months of the pandemic. So first I wanna tell you how happy I am that we're able to have our children and youth go back to in-person learning this fall. We all know how much students and families have been through because of the pandemic 
And school is so much more than academics alone. We know in-person learning is key to emotional and social skill development. This school year, our routines will look similar to last year because the threat of COVID-19 remains, and in particular, the Delta variant is here. Public Health has been working together with Halton School Boards every step of the way through the 2021-2022 school year planning process to ensure that we are balancing the learning needs of our students, their physical and mental health, and the safety measures required to reduce the chances of COVID-19 entering and circulating in our schools. So I'd like to start off by sharing some current COVID-19 trends in Halton region. Halton has seen over 18,600 cases of COVID-19 so far, and these are just the ones that we know about. The orange line on the far right indicates the most recent days of data when cases are likely to be underestimated. After reaching an all-time peak in mid-April, cases have significantly declined over the summer due to the enormous vaccination campaign that has been underway, as well as enhanced public health measures. Since late July, we have started to see an increase in cases once again. Experts in Canada have confirmed we are now firmly in the fourth wave of the pandemic. As you can see in the figure above, this new wave is being driven by the Delta variant, whereas in the third wave, cases were driven by the Alpha variant. The Delta variant has increased from only 1% of cases in April of 2021 to 67% of cases in July. And the proportion of Delta cases has likely climbed higher in the last few weeks alone. There are a few reasons why this is important. First, individual protection against the Delta variant improves greatly after the second dose of the vaccine. Second, we know that the Delta variant is much more contagious, so we will need higher vaccination rates in our community than previously thought in order to protect the whole of our community. And we will also need to continue certain public health measures, such as physical distancing and masking in many settings. During the 2020-2021 school year, there were a total of 1,197 total school exposure investigations and 41 school outbreaks in Halton. With Delta as the dominant variant of the virus circulating in our community, I fully expect that there will be more student cases and exposures to come this fall. That's why it's so important to have layers of protection at our schools and within our community including in your own homes, to ensure we are doing everything possible to reduce the spread this fall. I will talk about how we can protect each other and our schools a bit later in the presentation. Children's mental health and behavior have been negatively impacted by necessary school closures and the shift to remote learning. Young children and adolescents have been impacted differently. Based on recent data, parents of young children have reported more behavioral challenges, while adolescents were more likely to report increased anxiety and depressive symptoms. Parents in Halton have identified concerns around their children's mental health, loneliness, and isolation. These trends are seen not only here in Halton, but across Canada. Youth may be particularly vulnerable to negative effects of school closures as school connectedness is associated with many benefits for students. Schools also serve as a key setting for mental well-being promotion and access to mental health services. In order to keep schools open this year and avoid worsening child and youth mental health outcomes, we'll need to work together. So I'll now talk about how we plan to achieve this. There are many people and organizations that have come together to develop our 2021-2022 school reopening plan in Halton, and I'm grateful for their time, cooperation, and dedication to giving our school communities a balanced plan. I'll now speak about some of the key features of this plan. When it comes to implementing appropriate public health measures, Halton Region Public Health provides guidance that aligns with Ontario's Ministry of Health. 
Guidance documents, as well as other important resources and links are available on our website for school staff and parents. To start, students in grade one to grade 12 must wear masks indoors, including in hallways, during classes and on school vehicles. Although the Ministry of Education encourages kindergarten students to wear a mask indoors, Halton Region is going above and beyond to ensure our children's safety. On public health recommendations, Halton schools have implemented masking for junior and senior kindergarten. Students do not need to wear masks outdoors, but distancing should happen between different cohorts outdoors as much as possible. This is being done to reduce the risk and to keep schools open. Masks may be temporarily removed indoors for eating and drinking at lunch or break times. All staff and visitors in schools must wear medical masks and should use eye protection such as face shields or goggles when working with children who are unable to wear masks consistently and correctly or when close contact is required, such as in a kindergarten class. Staff may remove medical masks indoors when eating and drinking while maintaining at least two meters distance from others. In an environment where everyone is masked, eye protection is generally not required. Eye protection is required when you will come in close contact with someone unmasked. As always, reasonable exceptions for medical conditions will apply for both staff and students. All students, teachers and school staff must continue to self screen for COVID-19 symptoms every day before attending school or childcare and complete the provincial school and childcare screening tool. The screening tool must be completed every day of the week, including weekends and holidays. Yes, parents, that's right. Parents and caregivers can complete the tool on behalf of a student. We are aware that the Ministry of Health is currently revising the screening tool to include a shorter list of symptoms. The intention is to have it released next week in time for school reopening. Parents, students and staff must use the most recent version of the screening tool. A green screen as shown here will indicate that the student, teacher or staff person is safe to attend school or childcare that day. If the student, teacher or staff person does not pass the screening tool, the results will be a red screen with an X as shown. Follow the directions provided, which may include contacting the school to let them know about the result, self-isolating, which means your entire household must isolate except for individuals who are fully vaccinated or considered to have immunity because they've had a, a, po a positive test result in the last 90 days, or talking with a physician or a healthcare provider to get assessed and tested. Individuals who are fully vaccinated and have symptoms not related to a known condition must also self-isolate and get tested. Some people may experience COVID-19 vaccine side effects 48 hours after receiving their vaccine. You can go to school or childcare if you or anyone in your household received a COVID-19 vaccine in the last 48 hours and are experiencing any of these symptoms that are mild and only began after vaccination. The Ministry of Health may direct school boards and schools to perform daily on-site confirmation of self-screening, such as during a period of potential higher transmission, for example, after a holiday period. School boards will have a process in place to implement on-site confirmation of self-screening of individuals if required. As I mentioned, the Ministry is in the process of shortening the symptom list on the screening tool. There's not one specific measure that will prevent transmission from occurring in schools, but a combination of elements that contribute to making schools healthier spaces to work and learn. Masking and screening are only two examples of protective strategies schools are expected to implement. Another strategy to be used in combination with masking and screening is physical distancing. Public health encourages as much distance as possible between students, between students and staff and between staff members. Physical distancing measures are then to be layered with other public health measures, such as hand hygiene, cohorting and enhanced cleaning. 
The more measures we put in place, the lower the risk will be. These measures will help keep our schools open. Students will need to be tested for COVID-19 if they are experiencing new or worsening symptoms of COVID-19 and no alternate diagnosis has been provided by their primary care provider, or if they've been identified as having a high risk exposure for COVID-19. This applies to people who have been vaccinated and are not vaccinated yet. Public Health will provide guidance to cohorts that have been identified to have a high risk exposure. This guidance will include when and where to get tested. Currently, testing for when you meet the two criteria shown on the slide is only available at our local assessment centers located in our hospitals. In the previous school year, school-based asymptomatic testing was available to students, children and um, staff who were not showing symptoms and had not been identified as close contacts of COVID-19. And this testing was provided either at participating schools or through pharmacies. However, this program ended on June the 30th, 2021. We are currently awaiting further guidance from the ministry on whether this program will be available to staff and students this year in Halton. So let's talk a little bit about case management and contact tracing. When there's a COVID-19 case at a school, Halton Region Public Health will follow the most current Ministry of Health COVID-19 guidance for school case contact and outbreak management. Halton Region Public Health notifies the school, investigates whether others at the school are impacted, and identifies any others who will need to be contacted and possibly tested. Once our investigation is complete, we provide direction for the affected cohorts and the teachers. An outbreak is declared if there are two or more confirmed cases and at least one case could have been acquired in the school setting within a 14 day period. Public health will conduct a risk assessment and investigate where the outbreak exists within the school. The outbreak will be posted on Halton's web page dashboard after communication has gone out to the local school community. Our staff will work with schools every step of the way throughout the process. If a class cohort is dismissed based on the risk assessment, vaccination status of individuals will be taken into consideration along with other information such as duration and location of exposure and the PPE worn. Generally speaking, someone who's fully vaccinated or considered to have immunity does not have to isolate after a high risk exposure to a case of COVID-19. They will be directed, however, to get tested and monitor for symptoms. However, there may be situations when fully vaccinated individuals will be directed to self-isolate after a high-risk exposure. For example, where a strain of the virus that is known to cause more breakthrough cases, that is cases in fully vaccinated individuals, has been identified. And we have had this happen here in Halton. Halton Region Public Health also has staff working in many areas across the COVID-19 response to support our schools and families during, uh, including the 311 uh, call center or Access Halton, as well as our public health call center. The uncertainty of the pandemic combined with the more common back to school nervousness is a lot to manage. So I encourage you all to talk to your children about how they're feeling about going back to school. Listen to what they have to say and reach out for help if you need it. We have developed six short animated videos on common public health measures to help you review these tips. They can be found on our COVID-19 school and child care information webpage. I'll now, I'll now take a few minutes to talk about vaccination, including our youth vaccination strategy. To be fully vaccinated, students must have received two doses of the Pfizer vaccine, which is currently the only vaccine authorized for individuals under the age of 18. Being fully vaccinated not only protects children and youth against COVID-19, but also helps prevent the virus from spreading to those who may be at greater risk of serious illness. As of last week, all Halton youth born in 2009 or earlier that live or attend school in Halton can get their COVID vaccines through any of our walk-in community clinics. 
Appointments for youth are also available at participating pharmacies and primary care offices. These appointments must be booked directly through the pharmacy or your primary care office. Visit covid19.ontario.ca for more information on participating locations. Vaccines work. For cases reported in June to August among 12 to 17 year olds in Halton, 100% were among the unvaccinated or those who had only received one dose. The most recent data shows that the COVID-19 vaccination rates amongst 12 to 17 year olds who had received their first dose was 87% and 77% for those who have received both doses. Milton is outpacing the rest of the community with over 90% of this age group with one dose and 80% with two dose. Go Milton! While this is extremely encouraging, I think we can do better. It's critical that we have a very high vaccination rate, as close to 100% as we can get it. Some people feel worried that the vaccine was developed very quickly. The vaccine was developed so quickly because the science behind these vaccines was already established before COVID-19. No steps were skipped in the process of developing, testing, approving and producing the vaccine. They were produced faster than usual because of never before seen levels of collaboration and funding from around the world invested in this effort. Clinical trials also had quick access to a large pool of study participants. Many people have been safely vaccinated all over the world. The benefits of vaccination outweigh the risk of getting severe COVID-19 illness. Although rare, there may be long-term complications from COVID-19 affecting multiple organ systems. Long-term effects can include memory loss, fatigue, body aches, unexplained breathing difficulties, and damage to your lungs and heart. Some of the people with long-term symptoms from COVID-19 infection are young and healthy, unfortunately. Clinics have been set up to support the many COVID-19 patients who, although they are no longer infected, cannot go back to work or live a normal life because of these long-lasting symptoms. Vaccination not only protects against this, but severe side effects from vaccines are very rare. During the past school year, 71% of cases among children aged 0 to 11 were household exposures, meaning they became infected by someone in their household. We can protect members of our community who cannot be vaccinated, including children under the age of 12, by having a large proportion of the eligible population fully vaccinated. By receiving the vaccine, you are much less likely to become sick. And if you do become sick with COVID-19, you are less likely to spread the virus. Young families may be concerned about vaccination because they've heard that it can affect fertility or it's not safe during breastfeeding. This is not true. When vaccines were first available in Canada, pregnant people were advised against receiving the vaccine because they had been excluded from the early vaccine studies. Now we have more data from within Canada and around the world that the COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective in pregnant and breastfeeding women. In fact, leading experts like the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada recommend getting both doses of COVID-19 vaccines if you are planning a pregnancy or if you are already pregnant or breastfeeding. If you're thinking of becoming pregnant or are pregnant, getting the vaccine as soon as possible is also the best way to protect yourself. Pregnant people with COVID-19 infection are at higher risk of hospitalization and admission to the ICU than non-pregnant people of the same age. So let's shift gears a little bit and not talk about COVID. Routine vaccinations are also important. It's important that parents look at their child's immunization card and ensure that they are up to date on all of their regular immunizations. Ages to remember for these vaccines are generally between the ages of 4 to 6 and 14 to 16 when you require a booster shot. If you're unsure, find out from your family doctor and make sure you get your child immunized as soon as possible. 
I also want to let parents know that the Immunization of School Pupils Act, requiring all families with children attending school in Ontario to provide public health with a record of their ch child's immunization, will not be enforced during the 2021-2022 school year. This means we will not be using the potential of suspensions this year for those students whose immunization is not updated. We will continue to send reminder notices to urge you gently to update your, the, the records with us in time for the next school year. Please remember it is the parent or guardian's responsibility to report all routine immunizations using Halton Region's online immunization reporting tool. Go to halton.ca slash immunize to use this tool. Please do not report COVID vaccines through this online tool. If your child received a COVID-19 vaccine in Ontario, it is already recorded in the province's COVID-19 immunization database called COVAX, and you do not need to submit additional proof at this time. There have been many disruptions to routine school vaccination clinics offering vaccines against hepatitis B, HPV, and meningitis due to the COVID-19 related school closures. This year, Halton Region will be running new community clinics for school-based immunizations that were missed or upcoming. This chart shows the vaccines and the birth year and grades that will be eligible to book appointments this fall. All of this information will be available on halton.ca slash immunize, and we will ensure to communicate with you in September via your school about how to book appointments if your child is eligible. We are making arrangements to have clinics in each municipality during hours outside of school hours so as not to cause any disruption to learning. At one point or another, you may feel worried about your child's mental health and wonder where to go to for help. This is natural. At school, students and parents or guardians can speak to their teacher or other trusted staff person, such as a child and youth counselor or social worker. The school board website and the mental health page at halton.ca slash mental health both have tips, resources, and lists of local organizations that you can easily access. Our Halton Parents Public Health nurses are also available to provide mental health support and help connect you with community supports. So as I mentioned, one of public health's excellent services for children and families is Halton Parents. If you have any parenting questions from the early years of toddler tantrums to the teen years, remember our Halton Parents Public Health nurses and dietitians are here for you. Connect with us on social media, through email or by calling 311. We also have many helpful back to school blogs to read and live discussions happening on Facebook. As always, I would like to remind you of the importance of following certain public health measures. Returning safely to school is a community effort based on individual actions, and we all have a role to play in helping to keep our numbers low. This means that we are counting on you to get vaccinated if you were born in 2009 or earlier, practice lots of physical distancing, wear a mask in indoor public places and outdoors when physical distancing cannot be maintained, complete the COVID-19 screening tool daily, follow good hand hygiene and cover your coughs and sneezes, get tested if you have one or more symptoms of COVID-19, and stay home when ill, even if you have very mild symptoms. It is everyone's responsibility to ensure that we continue to follow these measures both in and out of schools to keep our children, staff and families safe. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention and we'll now move on to the question and answer period. So thanks for that, Dr. McGinney. I, I know a lot of people's questions would have been answered through the presentation, so thank you for all that detail. Um, but we did compile some questions from from our families um, that um, that we're hopeful that you can you can address tonight. So our our first question is the following. <coughs> Excuse me. Why are JK SK children being asked to wear masks when the teachers are vaccinated? 
and the data shows that children under five are unlikely to get sick? And that's a great question, Pat. Um, and you know, last year, uh, you know, we had, we had sort of had a, a bit of a pause on this, but now with the highly transmissible Delta variant uh, being the most common circulating variant of the COVID-19 virus, and knowing that it causes more severe illness than the original virus, as well as the alpha variant from the third wave of the pandemic, we really need to have every appropriate level of protection in place in order to reduce spread while allowing our children to have access to in-person learning. So while it is true that younger children are less likely to get sick and become severely sick with COVID, we're still learning a lot about the Delta variant and how young children are affected. And so it makes sense at this point in time that we recommend that junior kindergarten and senior kindergarten children be asked to wear masks. Pat, I think your mic is off. Sorry about that. Sorry, thanks, Dr. McGanny. I, I should be better at, at this after after the amount of uh, webinars we've done. Uh, so I'll, I'll start that over again. So Dr. McGanny, why are students not permitted to remove masks while seated at their desks? Allowing students to remove masks while seated would be consistent with the rules for indoor dining and office workplaces. What's the science behind the different rules for students? So as I talked about earlier, masking is a protective strategy against COVID-19 in order to reduce the risk of spreading uh, this disease. And masking needs to be used in combination with other protective measures such as cohorting, physical distancing, hand hygiene, and uh, other respiratory etiquette. The science shows that the more protective factors utilized, the greater the risk and redu uh, the reduction in the risk and spread of COVID-19. And we know that in the classroom setting, maintaining physical distancing of two meters can be a challenge. Since we can't guarantee that all of the student desks are two meters or more apart, students are being required to wear masks indoors at all times, including while seated at a desk. Um, you know, just in terms of the office workplace piece, I just wanna clarify that masks are required unless there is adequate physical distancing in place at your office space. And for indoor dining, uh, this is a non-essential activity and public health continues to recommend that this be done only with one's own family to reduce the potential of spreading from uh, asymptomatic individuals. Okay, thank you. So the next few questions are around case management and, and protocols. So, so the first one is what are the protocols in place during case management for vaccinated staff and students? So when Halton Region Public Health is made aware of a, a COVID-19 exposure in a school um, and then determines that there's been a transmission risk to others in the school, including students, staff, or members of the school community, uh, our public health nurses will complete a risk assessment. All students and staff who are identified as being um, uh, having had a high risk exposure will be notified and provided a letter with detailed instructions on um, isolation as well as testing requirements for each individual, whether you are fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated or unvaccinated. All high risk contacts should get tested regardless of your immunization status. In general, individuals who are fully immunized or previously positive within the last 90 days will not necessarily require isolation unless we, we uh, direct it at the public health level. All high risk contacts will be dismissed until vaccination status can be verified. So that can sometimes take a day uh, to sort out. Um, once ver verification of vaccine status is complete, fully vaccinated students and staff may be permitted to return to school. I know this is a lot of information for all of you as parents. Please don't worry about taking notes. What you need to remember is that should an exposure occur in your child's classroom, we will provide you with detailed information and instructions at that time. Okay, and I, I think this leads into the next question as well. If everyone can be a carrier, regardless of whether they're vaccinated or not, 
why would only the unvaccinated students be sent home in the event of another student in the same cohort testing positive? So why not the whole cohort? Right. So if an exposure occurs, the whole cohort will be sent home until vaccination status can be confirmed. So we talked about that earlier. The fully vaccinated students will be allowed to return to school because the risk of a fully vaccinated person catching the virus and becoming a breakthrough case and thus able to transmit the virus to others is still much lower than an unvaccinated individual's chances of getting infected and transmitting the virus. In Ontario, um, between December of last year and uh, early August of this year, unvaccinated cases accounted for the majority of COVID-19 cases reported and breakthrough cases reported for about 0.6% of all cases. So as you can see, the risk is highly mitigated by, um, by, by vaccine. Okay, so, so what protocols are in place for staff and students who elect to come to school with symptoms or are awaiting COVID results? Yeah, and, and we talked about that currently the screening is self-screening. So there's no requirement for active screening in schools at this time. However, screening is one of the many measures in place and how well these measures work depends on how well everyone does their part. Uh, so be honest when you're going through that screening tool. Um, the Ministry of Health may direct school boards and schools to perform daily on-site confirmation of self-screening, such as during a period of potential higher transmission, for example, after a holiday period, and I mentioned this before. And school boards will have a process in place should that be required. All staff and students are required to complete that provincial screening tool daily, um, and then they should follow the instructions on the screening tool prior to attending school. Passive screening posters are also posted on school entrances, and I'm sure many of you have seen these. Students or staff should not attend school if they have new worsening symptoms of COVID-19 or while they're awaiting COVID-19 test results. However, if an individual becomes symptomatic while at school, um, school boards are required to have a protocol in place, and I know that all of you do, uh, and the protocol should involve removing the ill individual from the classroom, moving them to a designated area to isolate away from others, um, and then in the event it is a student, their parent or guardian should be contacted to pick them up immediately. Any staff or visitors with signs or symptoms of COVID-19 must go home immediately. And the individual should um, not take school or public transportation on their way home. So if individuals um, have symptoms compatible with COVID-19, they should get tested and isolate while their test results are pending. Um, or not available unless there is a known alternative diagnosis that has been provided by their healthcare provider. So Dr. McGanny, has there been a rise in COVID cases in children within our region here in Halton? And will Halton Public Health report those numbers? Right, um, so as Ontario continues to reopen, we are seeing case numbers increase in all age groups, uh, including the uh, child population. All the cases in our youth that we're aware of to date, as I mentioned, are, are unvaccinated. Uh, these numbers are reported on our dashboard, which can be accessed by visiting halton.ca slash COVID-19 and clicking on the current cases in Halton tab. So once you do this, uh, you will access the latest data and we do update it on a daily basis. Uh, right now, we're not reporting on weekends, but we are reporting um, on weekdays. So I encourage everyone who's, who, who wants to look at this dashboard to become familiar with it. That is where you're going to find that, in, that information. Thanks. You know, we see in the media that um, other countries and provinces um, have no COVID measures in their schools or they've really kind of gone back to normal. So, so why are the COVID measures still in place here in Halton and I guess more specifically at Halton Catholic? You know, I think um, what we're talking about is uh, as Ontarians and as, uh, you know, residents of Halton, uh, we're taking um, the, the safety and the health of our students and our staff very seriously. And that's why we need to keep some of these measures in place. Our goal is to keep schools open for as long as possible. 
Uh, and uh, many of you may have heard certain medical officers of health, including myself last year, say that, you know, schools should be the first to open, the last to close um, because of the importance of in-person learning. So in order to keep our cases low, we need to have all of these infection control practices in place and increase vaccination rates amongst those who are eligible. Uh, and so I encourage parents to get vaccinated as soon as they can to protect all of our age groups, including those who are not yet eligible for vaccination. If you're currently on the fence about vaccination, please make sure you're looking at credible information, not things that you get on WhatsApp, but go online, go to the Halton website or the Public Health Agency of Canada's website, uh, look at that information and also reach out to experts such as your family doctor or public health. As I mentioned, uh, we're available to help you either calling 311 or going to Halton Parents. We're, we're here to help you make that decision. Okay, have we got time for one more question? Yeah, this is a bit of a two-parter, so there's a little bit of a preamble to it. Um, with the new Ministry of Ed guidelines, it states that classroom cohorts will still exist, yet children will be able to use common areas and possibly mixing of cohorts outdoors and in some extracurricular activities. Um, so question number one is, can you explain why it's safe to mix sometimes, but not all the times? Um, doesn't that defeat the purpose of the cohort? And then secondly, uh, are there different directives from Halton Public Health uh, for our region? Yeah, this is definitely a tough question. Um, as I mentioned before, cohorting is one layer of protection and it's to reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19 so that it stays in, in, a, in a bubble or a cohort, if you will. Um, and so it's not possible to maintain staff or student cohorts in all situations. Um, so our recommendation is to maintain cohorts in as many areas or activities as possible. Uh, while we're still trying to have a balanced approach to allowing students to participate in activities that were not permitted earlier uh, in the pandemic. Um, but we are taking the approach that uh, even outdoors, you really should be maintaining that cohort, um, uh, even in the outdoor environment, as well as in the indoor environment. But we know that you will, you know, many people will choose to have children engaged in other activities outside of the school setting. And in that case, it becomes particularly important that you reduce your contacts by doing other things, such as making sure that there's physical distancing happening in those environments and masking as well. Thanks for that, Dr. McGanny. And thanks for all of those responses. Um, I think in the time we have remaining, if it's okay, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit about our specific plans here in Halton and, and you're certainly uh, welcome to, to stay for the rest of the presentation. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to get us to switch over our slides here, if we could. And I think, uh, thanks very much. Uh, I, I think what, what we'll see or, or what our, our parents and students will see is obviously um, some repetition from, from Dr. McGanny's presentation uh, because our, our um, return to school plan is both in alignment with, with public health in our region and with the ministry directive. So since last spring, uh, we've had a number of working groups uh, at, at the board here um, uh, planning for our return to school in September. As we've uh, got additional guidance from the province over the last month or so, um, these groups have, have been working more and more at finalizing our plans and really Amongst these five groups, um, our goals for the year, both to start the year and throughout the year are the following. We want to ensure that we have protocols in place so that our students and staff remain healthy and safe. In terms of student achievement, we'll assess what gaps there may be and develop plans to provide appropriate interventions. So we'll, our goal, as it always is, is to meet the needs of all our learners. We will continue remote learning for students who choose that, but we're also looking to uh, enhance our online learning to supplement in-school instruction. So we did so much work last year around online learning that we certainly 
uh, want to be able to provide that uh, in for students who are studying remotely in the event that we might have to go remote, but also for our face-to-face -face students. We'll continue to focus on mental health supports for our student staff and our families, and we continue those mental health supports throughout the summer. And ultimately, we want to re-engage our school community by reintroducing things like co-curricular activities, school social events, and for us here in Halton Catholic, that really important and dynamic partnership between home, school, and parish. So a bit of a, a quick overview of what our parents and students can ex expect. So for our elementary schools, the vast majority of our students will return to face-to-face in-person instruction. So through K to grade eight, students will attend school each day of the week, five days per week, with a three minute, 300 minute full instructional day. Our students will remain with their class cohort for the full day. So as we did last year, some of those specialized programs, teachers will come to the classroom as opposed to rotating students through the building. And again, as we did last year, uh, for students who may need to participate in smaller groups uh, for particular learning uh, interventions, that will also be done with the appropriate protocols put in place. Parents would also be aware that we're gonna to continue to operate a separate virtual Catholic elementary school, and that option was open to parents um, to sign up for the school uh, towards the end of the last school year and through the summer. In terms of our secondary schools, and, and secondary schools will look different this year because all of our students who are attending face-to-face -face will attend each day of the week and again for five instructional hours or 300 minutes of instruction. So for semester one, uh, the ministry did instruct school boards to timetable students with no more than two courses at one time. So students will uh, study two courses in a block and then another two courses. In our board here in Halton Catholic, we'll offer a quadmester model which we did last year as well, but with our students attending every day, all day. So students um, will go to two classes per quadmester. The classes are the quadmesters last approximately 10 weeks, and then they'll start up two more new classes. So by the end of that 20 week period, or what would be a traditional semester, students will have completed four classes. The remote learning option for our secondary schools will remain the same as it was last year. So that's the hybrid model that we use. So students will connect remotely from home with their class in their home school. And we decided to stay with this model because it, off, it allows us to offer complete course offerings for all of our secondary students and all of the programming options that we have. It keeps students connected to their home school. We're hoping it's gonna facilitate and encourage participation in school extracurricular op opportunities. Students will belong to a class in their home school, regardless of whether they're face-to-face -face or learning remotely. And we really hope students will be able to reestablish connections with their school and their peers which we think will help promote positive mental health and positive re-engagement of students into the life of the school. So the, the, the school day for a secondary student, there will be a block of instruction to start the day in the morning of 150 minutes with a break built in. So for example, a student might uh, be in their grade nine English class for the morning. And so after period one's completed, Students will then go to their period two class. So again, that grade nine student, he's going to do English in the morning and then followed by, let's say, grade nine math. Within that second block of time, our schools will be structured to have four separate lunch periods. So they'll be organized by grade. So grade nines will have a lunch period, grade tens, grade elevens, and grade twelves. And the idea behind breaking up the lunches into four periods is to have a better um, ability to maintain some distancing at lunch. Our cafeterias will be open with, with some limited seating. Um, so 
we felt by staggering our lunches that we would have a better opportunity to maintain distancing and uh, and be able to help ensure the health and safety of our students and, and uh, our staff as well. In terms of um, supporting our students with special needs, we'll continue to support our students with their homeroom teacher and resource teachers as they normally would and as per their individual education plan. Um, if students do our, if, if uh, students with special needs are engaging in remote learning, they'll have live contact with the teacher and uh, expectations, specific expectations around synchronous or real-time learning will be included in their timetable. The types of meetings that um, parents and students may have either with school staff or board level staff, professional support services, they'll continue uh, either face-to-face -face if possible or remotely or potentially a combination of both. As Dr. McGanny mentioned, and it's, it's something that, that we've been working on uh, since last spring and over the course of the summer, uh, it's really important for us to address um, the mental health and mental well-being of our students, our families, and our staff. Uh, so we'll, we have been providing professional learning for our system leaders, um, for our mental health professionals that we employ here. We'll continue with a tiered mental health approach. So. Um, mental health literacy for all students, particularly at the secondary level, and then um, more specified mental health supports for students who may need that. All of our schools will have a, a staff wellness committee as well as a, uh, a mental health committee uh, to support our students and staff. Uh, this is a, a change from last year. So last year we know at the secondary level, um, uh, cafeterias were not in operation, essentially par partially because uh, students left for the day after um, after instruction. Our cafeteria spaces will be open, but uh, it'll be limited uh, in terms of how many students will be able to fit into the cafeteria. Um, so it'll be based on um, the capacity of the cafeteria and then our ability to distance the chairs. Um, so each school might look a little bit different in our secondary schools in terms of their overall capacity. And also we'll be reintroducing this year both uh, nutrition programs and third party food programs uh, that we were not able to, to, to provide last year. So at, um, at elementary, most typically, you know, a hot lunch day or, or pizza day, those will be permitted. Uh, with the appropriate health and safety protocols put in place and a return to um, our volunteer uh, volunteers who will be uh, handling food to have um, safe handling practices in place. In terms of uh, clubs and extracurricular activities, we know that the life of the school involves many things beyond uh, just the curricular instructional program. Uh, the life of the school and the experience for students is really enhanced. Uh, by clubs and extracurricular activities. They will, will be permitted. Uh, we will be running sports programs in conjunction with the protocols that will be put in place by our provincial sports associations in consultation with local public health as well. Um, we'll, uh, we'll be starting up in the fall with both indoor and outdoor sports. We're very excited for our students to be able to participate again in extracurricular activities, um, ones of uh, athletic nature, the arts, leadership, all of those things that we're hoping we can re-engage our students and our staff um, back into the life of the school beyond the classroom. Um, Dr. McGanny talked quite a bit about the number of different types of protective strategies that schools will have in place. And I think it's important to note, regardless of the strategies um, individually, they all work together. Uh, so it's not enough to have um, distancing. It has to be in combination with uh, student masks and uh, respiratory etiquette and hand washing and improved ventilation, all of those vaccinations. Um, all of those things will work together to help provide a safe environment for our students. Uh, our staff uh, will receive uh, updated health and safety training 
uh, in one of the PA days prior to the beginning of the school year. Um, and they'll also uh, spend certainly the first few days of class time uh, reintroducing our students to the health and safety protocols that we had in place last year and will continue this year that our students really did a great job with. And that's a testament to the work of both our staff and to our parents who encourage those health and safety protocols uh, with their kids out in the community as well as at home. As Dr. McGanny mentioned, all staff and students and visitors will be required to conduct the daily self-assessment using uh, the provincial screening tool. All of our visitors to the school and visitors will still be limited to the school, but they'll have to undergo that self-screening and then confirm, confirm that upon arrival at the school. Um, hand hygiene, as it was last year, will be emphasized again this year. Um, with uh, both soap and water, um, uh, with um, dispensers throughout the schools. Um, so that won't be a change from last year. We'll continue along with that process. As Dr. McGanny mentioned, all of our students, kindergarten to grade 12, will be required to wear masks in the building, as will all of our staff and visitors. So all students, staff, and visitors wearing masks indoors, in classrooms, in hallways, uh, on any school transportation. Uh, there will be mask breaks built into the day. Students will have at elementary the opportunity at recess to have their masks off, and obviously when they're eating and drinking as well. As we did last year, there will be reasonable exceptions uh, to students wearing masks. Uh, essentially, those are uh, whether a student has a pre-existing medical condition, um, a diagnosis in, in their learning profile or learning style that would inhibit their ability to wear a mask. Um, and, and those exemptions uh, need to be supported by a healthcare practitioner. Parents and guardians will receive that information from their school principal. And it's important to note uh, that certainly around the exemptions, they need to be updated for this school year. Physical distancing will, will continue to be encouraged. Uh, in addition to encouraging it, we'll continue to try and uh, limit extra furniture in classrooms. Um, I think we added an additional 20 outdoor classroom spaces over the course of the summer. So while the weather is good, we'll, we'll continue to encourage classes um, to explore outside. We'll stagger our student lunch and recess times to limit numbers um, and certainly also um, uh, stagger movement around the building. Students will be able to access lockers uh, and cubbies this year. So individual schools will have processes in place to make sure that we limit students congregating in any of those places. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the shared spaces that were kind of off limits last year, including libraries, uh, computer or tech labs, gymnasiums will be allowed for use. Distancing will need to be maintained um, and masking requirements obviously indoors will be will be really important to emphasize as well. We'll continue to try and minimize uh, contacts where we, we can. Uh, so we'll have, you know, fairly specific drop off and pick up protocols. Um, we'll really try and restrict non essential visitors to the school. Uh, as we said, students and staff are expected to conduct their their um, screening process each day. Students will be cohorted as much as possible. We've continued uh, to install bottle fillers as opposed to to replace water fountains in our elementary and secondary schools as well. And I, I think I covered off on, on that one. Um, uh, one of the things that people are, are very interested in is uh, is ventilation systems. Uh, all of our schools have been inspected since last spring. Uh, in schools where there was recommissioning and balancing that was needed, that was conducted. Conducted, sorry. We've updated all of our equipment to the highest rated MERV filters that are possible. We'll continue as we did last year to run our ventilation equipment 
before and after building occupancy. We'll increase the number of air exchanges during the day to also help improve air quality. All of our HVAC systems have been calibrated for maximum airflow. Standalone HEPA filter units will be placed in all kindergarten classrooms and in some other selected classroom or learning areas in order to improve air exchange. We'll be reporting on these ventilation measures publicly on our board and school websites uh, beginning in September. As we did last year, we'll also continue with enhanced cleaning and disinfection throughout the building during the school day when students and staff are in the building, as well as uh, each evening once our students and staff have left for the day. Um, all of our students uh, and, and staff are familiar with the signage that was put up last year um, in, in buildings, whether it's on the floor or markings or reminders around uh, screening protocols. All of those will be in place uh, this year as well. Dr. McGanny talked about um, uh, the symptom protocol and case management that the region will will follow will continue to take direction um, from Halton Public Health when it comes to those protocols uh, as positive cases or if if and when positive cases do arise in our in our school communities. I understand uh, and, and sorry kind of a, a, a late or relatively new addition. Um, uh, people would be aware that last week the province did announce um, to support the return to school plan uh, a, a vaccination disclosure policy, which will be put in place for all of our em employees and um, and uh, frequent visitors to our building. We'll share some more information with that procedure as we gain further information from the ministry. And uh, that was a, a number, a quick overview, um, but I do want parents to know that um, as we continue to update our protocols, our information will be available on our Halton Catholic District School Board website. Our updated return to school plan will be posted this week. We'll continue to work on answering some of those frequently asked questions that we've got so far, and we'll continue to do so and update uh, as new questions arise when we come in. So that's my overview of our planning so far. Uh, I, I really do want to stress how excited we are to welcome our students back uh, into our schools in September. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing our students again. We've worked very hard since last spring to have the appropriate protocols and procedures in place to ensure the safety of our students and staff. We'll continue to do that we're looking to re-engage our students in as many ways possible and our parents. So um, I, I would like to close again by thanking Dr. McGanny for being with us tonight. So being, being so generous uh, with her time and to all of her staff for the partnership that we've had, as she mentioned, for many years, uh, but certainly over the last year and a half, um, a really crucial partnership to help ensure that our schools stay safe, stay safe, and stay open. And that's our goal moving forward for this year. So Dr. McGanny, thanks again. I wish everybody um, uh, a great final couple of weeks in the summer, and we can't wait to see our students return in September. Thanks very much and have a great night.